that being said, today we are in Acts 14. I believe we're finishing up Acts 14 today. And it's a wonderful passage. It's not a very long one, but it is packed full of delightful fruit for us this morning. Uh, it's been a blessing for me to study through it, so I hope that it will be for you today. But we're looking at Acts chapter 14, 21 through 28. 21 through 28. Would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word? They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They said, Paul and Barnabas then appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Okay, this concludes what we've been studying as the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Now, I have the full map up here so we can see exactly what they did. And we've been, the past couple chapters and verses, we've been reading all about this. So remember, we had Antioch where the Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles in a marvelous way. And they ended up sending Paul and Barnabas to Cyprus. We, we read about all that happened in Cyprus. And they came up towards here, which is present-day Turkey, went through these towns and cities. Now, of course, the fastest way to go home would have been this way. <laughs> would have been uh, back towards Tarsus, which is not that far, Paul's hometown. Um, and what just happened to the Apostle Paul? We just read. He was stoned. Okay? He was just stoned and left for dead. I don't know if any of you have been stoned before, but it is not a pleasant experience. I have not been stoned, but all you got to do is go to the encyclopedia. I don't encourage you to look too far into it because it's a gruesome reality. As you know, stoning usually, uh, we don't know exactly the details of how it happened for Paul, but sometimes to make sure you were dead, they would bury you and put your head in the ground, essentially, and then everybody in the town would take a stone and throw it at you and hit you, and hit you in the head until you died of pure bludgeoning. And it was this communal act of punishment. Now, it sounds like this happened in quite a, a, a rush trial. You shouldn't be, you usually have to go through a trial. But as we've seen sometimes with the Jews, when they stir up trouble, they, they can expedite <laughs> and, go, and break the law. So it was a, a fake trial. But whatever happened with Paul, he was stoned. And so much so that the people that were stoning weren't like, we just beat him up. They thought he was dead. So he had taken blows to the head with rocks, was probably all cut up, bruised. I mean, passed out, thought he was dead. And some questions come to mind, right? Why did God let him suffer this? Surely, like, if you knew I was going to keep on with the ministry, what? Is it, was the stoning necessary? <laughs> Many of us would have gone, I'm done. That's it. I'm heading back on the fastest route home, right? But how does Paul respond? Well, first we see, it says the disciples gathered around him. We can uh, imagine that there was some level, of they, they brought him back to strength. He went back into the city. Now, I have been blessed at this church. This church is really good. When, when, when people are down, you all gather around them. And I commend you for that. That's the church we need to be. We need to be disciples like that, that when somebody is down and somebody's in need, you gather around them. And that's what we saw the disciples do. We don't know what they said. We don't know how much chicken soup they gave them or what happened. But I helped. And what did Paul do? He didn't go the fastest route home. He went back. He went back. In fact, if we look at that map and we read what we read, Paul went back to... The same cities he was just ministering, he, he, he took the long way home. He didn't go back to Cyprus. That actually, we're gonna, we, we, we learn more about Cyprus through Titus in the books of Titus. 
but he went back through these cities where he was having great difficulty. And not only that, but we see a continued correspondence between these people in present-day Turkey, which, as we know, it is Galatia at the time, which we get the book of Galatians. He's writing to these churches. But for the sake of those who did believe, for the sake of those that have received the gospel, he knew they needed more discipling, more time, more investment. It says in verse 21, they preached the gospel in that city. And that city, as we know from the previous text, is Derby, which is so he was stoned. And then they left that city and went on to Derby, which is another rural city. But then we know that he then comes back through them. But Derby was is a rural city, but it says they won many disciples there. And Derby was just as pagan as the other towns, had just as many of the same kind of problems, knew the same, we talked last time about Zeus and Hermes, had the same kind of resistance. But it wasn't noted here. It just says they won many disciples. And this is an important point because often God brings great fruit out of the greatest persecution and suffering. That for one moment we see Paul is struggling, same kind of demographic, same kind of people. He's struggling with them. They, they mistake them for these other gods. The other people from the towns and Jews come along, they stir up trouble and they stone him. He goes from this terrible day to one of the best days in ministry where it says there was pretty much no, and Luke wants us to know that there was no persecution, there was no resistance. People received the gospel in great number. And you guys remember... Um, Pastor Nathan, when he was here, he talked about trouble with the J-curve. Remember that? But often things go down before they go up. That's common. And here again, we see with the Lord that things went down for Paul in a very severe way. And then they went up. And that happens many times in our life. But it's so that we may grow in our relation to Christ, as we're going to see. But the night, beloved, is often darkest before the dawn. Amen? And things seem down, and the greatest persecutions hold on because some of the best growth might be around the corner. But we see Paul and Barnabas, though, so they go to Derby and then they come back. They come back through these cities. And this is an important thing to remember because Paul and Barnabas were invested in the life of the church. They were invested in the life of the church. They didn't run away, they came back, they continued to strengthen those. And that reminds us, church, that Christian discipleship requires investment on multiple levels in all people. Christian discipleship requires investment on multiple levels in all people. And where does that come from? The Great Commission. Often we look at the words of Jesus from the Great Commission where he sat the disciples down at the end of his ministry and he says, all authority has been given to me. Go therefore to all nations, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, making disciples teaching them all that I have commanded you. And what happened with Jesus? He spent three years with this very intimate group. They went to a, a seminary of hard knocks with Jesus, right? They had to go through many le levels of learning and memorizing and seeing and instructing. And Jesus says, as I have basically done with you, go and do likewise. And so the, the gospel and the church, yes, we, we've seen a lot of emphasis on evangelism, and that's good. But evangelism doesn't mean anything if there's not discipleship to withhold it, to hold on to it. If there's not investment made. You know, Billy Graham, when they did their crusades, they had a wonderful system of they would connect with all the churches. Because they knew it wasn't any good if we go and we have a whole arena full of people saying they believe, but nowhere to go and to grow and to learn the things that Jesus has taught us. To grow in their discipleship of becoming, right, like Christ. And that is digging in those roots that Jesus talks about. If they don't have any roots, what happens? They get washed away. So Paul and Barnabas, as they planted the churches, they modeled this understanding of discipleship, Christian discipleship. And we must never lose sight of that. Because often people try to gauge church success on how many baptisms you have or how many people attend your church services, right? That's not how the Bible defines success. Christ defined it as discipleship. Because if you look at Jesus' ministry, when he went to the cross, there wasn't anyone with him. They all scattered. And at the end of the day, he only had, a, you know, it says in the upper room, there were only 120 people that were still following. And he fed, member thousands, healed many, went through many different places. 
But I had about 120 that were hanging on in the end. But they were discipled, disciple makers. And that's the, that, that's the culture that we want here at our church, is a discipleship-making culture. Because ultimately, that is an exponential growth tool. Say that, say that I went and evangelized one person every day, 365 people a year or something who come to Christ. That's great. But say I disciple two or three people in a year. And then they go and disciple two and three people. And they disciple two and three people. Do you see how quickly that becomes an exponential amount of growth? And if you put that on a chart, if you had a bunch of people just doing evangelism, the discipleship method is four or five times a more amount of people that end up knowing Jesus. And not just on the superficial level, but intimately. They're learning how to form a relationship, that he has formed a relationship with us, right? They're learning the things that Jesus said in the Great Commission he has taught us. And so Paul and Barnabas are very aware of that. We can't just run for the hills. We can't do a one and done. What happened to those cool evangelists, right? They come back and they establish local teachers. So while Paul focused on church planting, he says though in 1 Corinthians that the goal of his labors and all these missionary journeys of him and Barnabas were to present everyone perfect in Christ to the Lord at his coming. We see that again and again, three different places. So today, the commentator Larkin, he puts it this way, a church, church plant, whatever ministry you may be, that does not make provision for discipleship is like a farmer who harvests well only to see the crop spoil because it's not properly stored. Right? So we see here that there are four things that I want us to note. The Apostle Paul modeled for us as investments. You think of any kind of strategic initiative, right? You have to think about how you invest. And a church should invest back in itself. I'm not talking purely monetarily. I'm talking how are we investing back into ourselves and our people and our disciples. And a church that does not invest back in itself, step out in faith, is a church that is doomed to failure. We have to go back. We have to continue to return. So we have our, our little thing with that little, that little hand with the little spinning circle, right? The lather, rinse, repeat. What's our process? And I think Paul and Barnabas laid out for us. So first they say, number one, churches must invest in, verse 22, the strengthening of souls. Now the word here, strengthening, connected to souls, has this idea of intensifying, intensifying souls, heating it up, building up, or buttressing. So I put this picture here. These are, you know, buttresses to hold, to firm it up, to strengthen it. Trees will actually, old trees will actually buttress themselves in their root system. Their roots become so buttressed. And that's super important. That's what Paul hears that churches must invest in buttressing, strengthening, intensifying the souls of its people. And we're talking about the souls of its people. Notice the strengthening effect, as we talked about, is not mere intellect, although that's, that, that's a fine goal, but it's not mere intellect as one might receive with simple, more Bible knowledge, but it was in their souls, their innermost being. Paul did not want them to be smarter sinners, but to be more like their Savior. Amen? Knowing the character of God. Our soul strength comes from our level of being close to the fire, being known in the character of God. But yes, we cannot, so many churches, we, we might become smarter sinners. We can understand theology in some way, or we can say big words, but we still don't know Jesus. And Jesus makes that claim to us, you know, but did we not do these things for you? Did we not do all these great works for you? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And Jesus says, yeah, but I don't know you. Who are you? What? So we can do a lot of things, but never know the source, right? The strength of Jesus Christ. And so our goal, and as Paul and Barnabas are showing, that primarily we want to strengthen your soul in the character of God. Your soul is not strengthened by facts as much as it is character of God, nearness of God. And let me, let me try to unpack this a little bit. For example, our souls are strengthened in drawing close to the heart of God, meditating on his words to us. His love for us. And I thought here, our soul's not strengthened after a good Christmas with our family, right? That's a soul-strengthening activity, to be with your family, 
like a Christmas or a birthday or to be with them even as a, an afternoon at the park. You leave that going, my soul is strengthened. When you have coffee with a good friend, right? My soul has been strengthened. There's not, there's not discussion there about like, let's hear it trivia night. Come on, let's go, right? There's a difference. It's a person. It's a, it's a character relation. And that's what Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas are speaking here. We want to strengthen your souls. Knowledge, yes, is important, but your souls. Because without that strengthening, the knowledge doesn't matter. It's just, it's just mere knowledge. Think about a good afternoon with your spouse or your children or a hearty meal with close friends. Soul strengthening. How much more is our souls strengthened when we spend time with Jesus? And of course, it begs the question, is our church fostering soul strength? Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, the only time he describes his heart in detail, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Soul strength. We must invest in soul strength. Number two, the churches and our church must invest in encouragement of faith. Verse 22 the encouragement of faith. This has many levels to it, but think of it this way. We encourage one another to have faith. To be faithful, to step out, to trust God. Faith requires exercise. We exercise our faith. We put our faith into practice. How many times are we seeing Jesus doing this to the disciples. Constantly putting them, he would make a statement, right? And then he would do an object lesson. He'd put his, he'd say, okay, you saw me preach it or act it out. Now it's time for you to walk it out. He would give them these opportunities to be faithful. And our church and the churches and good teaching is going to give you the opportunity to step out, to be faithful, to exercise it. Faith gets stronger the more you take it to the gym. You got to take your faith to the gym. You can't stay even just on the little five and 10 pounders, right? There's a progression in how you exercise. And here's the other beautiful thing. It's much easier to go to the gym when you have a gym friend, right? Who's telling you to get up, come on, let's go. And you them. I had a bad week, right? <laughs> I ate too much over the weekend. Get me in the gym. How much harder? To, uh, gym friends are everything. You cannot do it alone. You'll, you'll peter out, right? So you need some level of encouragement, but the same goes for faith, right? Your faith needs encouraging. It needs challenged to step out because it's a blessing, but you need to exercise it. And it says Paul and Barnabas here were encouraging them to have a culture of faith, to be faithful, to take the opportunities because how good it is when we come to moments of faith and we get to learn how strong the hands of God are, right? That he is always there, that he comes through. Therefore, church, are we encouraging a healthy lifestyle of faith in our church? Are we good gym partners to one another? Come on, we, we, we think, yeah, maybe this is a terrible analogy for most of us, cause, but you know, you gotta be spotters, right? Get that weight up, come on, let's put another one on. No, you can do it. How much, you know, we get stronger when we have somebody who's right there encouraging. We need a spotter <laughs> who can help us. Faith gets stronger the more you take it to the gym. Energize, exercise your friends. Is your family helping you? Are you helping your building a faith environment in your family? And, you know, the Bible also talks about how faith must be contended for contended for, built up. The Apostle Paul speaks of furnishing out your faith, right? We've been given this grace from God, this salvation from God, but part of our sanctification process is living it out, working out your salvation, as the Apostle Paul says, building it up, strengthening it, buttressing it, cherishing it, treasuring your faith, taking hold of your faith. We have in the church, particularly in our pretty lazy, I'm talking big C church environment, we believe that faith and, and what, we, we, well, we start to water down the disciplines of faith, the spiritual disciplines that are so important to us. If, 
Some of us say, oh, that seems so hard for me to do. I don't have faith. And we get so worried. You know, the reason we get worried and we get so fearful, and the reason I get worried and fearful, which I do all the time, and I get anxious or depressed, is because my faith is quite weak. Really, that was really what it comes down to. It sounds simplistic. But I just simply don't trust God enough. And why would I trust him if I've never allowed him to catch me, <laughs> to be there? I never give faith an opportunity to shine. Therefore, we have to be disciplined. We have to be disciplined. We have to practice faith. We have to choose faith. We have to jump out. You know, one of the wonderful ways of, of becoming more faithful that I've learned is studying faithful saints. Studying people like George Mueller, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Adoniram Judson. You know, people who have been, and you see in their stories and in their testimonies, that God is worthy of having faith in. He's worthy of trust. Faith is encouraged when we witness the blessing, the provision, and fruit of being faithful. When we jump, we find that Jesus is always there. Faith begets more faith. Amen? Challenge your faith. Build it up. If you don't have discipline in your life, if you don't step out, you're going to find... Your world is quite, you're going to find things quite small. And you're going to find the world to be a much more scary place. You're going to find yourself much more reticent. But that is not why the Apostle Paul and Barnabas are reminding us, no, encourage faith. Let's be a church that encourages faith. We see, um, and finally here, that our faith is encouraged not only just by one another, beloved, but amen, it's encouraged by the paraclete the parallel one, the Holy Spirit, who is our encourager, who is our confident, our, our advocate, our comforter. We are told to continue in, Christ says, to remain in this faith, his spirit. John 15, right? I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, abide in me. You want to have your faith encouraged? You want to exercise your faith? Remain in Christ. Stay close to him, right? It goes back to the comforting of your souls. Stay in the fire. Remain on the vine. Wait on the Lord. Stand on his promises. For as Hebrews says, he is the sustainer, the author, and the perfecter. He's the one perfecting, right? He's the perfecter of our faith. Psalm 23, he leads me to green pastures, right? He lets me lie down by the quiet streams. His rod and his discipline and his staff, they bring me comfort, He's the good shepherd. He's perfecting me. Allow him to take you, to pull you through, to challenge you as he did with the disciples. Fix your eyes on him, Peter, right? Step out, but keep your eyes centered on the perfecter, Christ. Submit to his beautiful pruning. And I say those words meaningfully, beautiful pruning. Because what's the next thing we have to invest in as a church, according to the Apostle Paul? And he said it quite clearly in the passage. Verse 23, right? We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The church must invest in hardships. When you think about the supply chain, that means investing in the refinery. Invest in the pruning. The word here is we must go through, going through something as if it's a doorway, sent through a process, right? The, the idea here that Peter picks up on is sent through like a refinery. To get precious metals, right, you have to burn away all of the, the junk around those metals. That's how you get to the precious diamonds. So you have to go through this process. God is said by the author of Hebrews to be that fire that burns away the junk, the dead wood. Hebrews 12, 21, it says, Our God is an all-consuming fire. And the Hebrew, writer of Hebrews, he writes, Everything has to be shook, <laughs> shaken one last time, and only that which is unshakable will remain. Faith without trial is not faith at all, right? Faith without trial 
is no faith at all. 1 Peter 1, 7, he says, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, any precious metal, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ted probably knows this. I found this interesting, but you know, Steinway pianos, beautiful pianos. You look at the process of making these pianos, it's quite intricate and intense, but this is something I, I saw. Every beautiful Steinway piano must go through what they call the pounder room, where each key is pounded 10,000 times to ensure quality and durability. Therefore, likewise, followers of Jesus Christ are being handcrafted with all the steps being watched over and directed by God. You look at those pianos and how the wood is curved and how it must be held under tension, held under pressure. And in the pounder room to, to test the keys and the hammer. I mean, Ted could enlighten us all day about that. All the, all the things that you would seem would be uncomfortable or would bring tension or pressure or cause things to feel like they're about to snap or actually being used by the creator, used by God to make a beautiful thing. The same goes for pruning, right? Uh, Matthew Wheeler, he was out there helping us trim up our branches. And you see they have all these branches. And a tree that doesn't get its branches cut, right, it starts to get weighed down. And then a storm comes along. And what happens? It breaks. The only way to survive the storm is to cut the branches. And you'll see the trees. And they'll go, they literally, after they've been cut, lift up. And they almost sigh. <laughs> you can see the trees. It's like, ah, oh, thank you, right? Don't fear the pruning process of God. Are you heavy laden? Are you burdened? Submit to the pruning. It's the best thing you could have. And when he prunes, say, ah, oh, yes. It hurts, right? The trees don't like it, I'm sure. They could feel and scream. It's, it's, it's not fun to have something chopped off your body. But what a healing process it is. It's not fun to go the panels to go through the pounder room. How many of you feel like you've gone through the pounder room in life? Just thing after thing, 10,000 blows, right? But what is God making you into? Again and again, the scriptures comment on this process. You cannot read the New Testament and see that it's going to be sunshine and rainbows for the believer. In fact, it's often the pounder room. It's often getting pruned because something beautiful has happened. The same kind of message was sent by Timothy, who is a young pastor, a young presbyter, an elder, who was trained by Paul, where he says in 1 Thessalonians, we sent Timothy, our brother, and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel to you to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials, for you know quite well that we are destined for them. Destined for them for them. Not only are we going to go through things because of just the sheer nature of the world, but in fact, God is over watching, destining, and allowing you to go through them for a reason. And for me, beloved, that gives me great comfort to know that I'm under the care and discipline of a good father. Not allow anything to happen to me if it were not for his good will and pleasure, even though I may not understand it or see it. I rest in that providence. And the apostle Paul says, the reason we sent Timothy here to encourage you, but Here's the fact. You become a church and you're becoming believers, baptized believers, you're going to face trials. And we wanted to send Timothy to you to remind you that that's going to happen and it's okay and it's a part of the whole plan. In fact, Paul says we must go through it to enter the kingdom of God. Says the man who probably still had a bandage on his head, right, where a rock had cleaved into his forehead. Again, you know, 1 Peter 5.10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, he himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. 2 Corinthians 12, Why hardship, says Paul? Because God is glorified. He says it in this, in 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. In our suffering, God is glorified. His power is shown. 
right? Faith without test, without trial is no faith at all. Therefore, the Apostle Paul says, because God is glorified in my suffering for what's happening in his kingdom, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Where are you most weak? That's the place God is going to use you the strongest, is where you're the weakest. That's how he works. He gets glory in the victory of small and broken things. He gets glory in the things that are weighed down and crushed. He's going to use you in your misery. Your misery will become a ministry. J. Vernon McGee, he wrote this. I know that it's not at all popular to teach that God will prove us and lead us to the maturity through suffering. People would rather be encouraged to think that they are somebody important and that they can do great things on their own. My friend, as J. Vernon, my friend, as he would say, we are nothing until the Spirit of God begins to move in our hearts and lives. We have nothing to offer God, yet he has everything to offer us. We must go through hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Does this make sense to you? Am I losing you? Right? Unless you go through them, you're, that, that J-curve, it never happens. You were made stagnant and broken and you never get to experience. The reason we go through hardship is we get to experience the power of God in it. Right? Yes. We get to see his mighty hands at work. How do you know they're mighty hands if you've never needed a mighty hand? Right? You'll never see it. You'll remain eternally blind. But a church that is built on the foundation of hardships and suffering is a church that can weather any storm. A church that is prepared and pruned and trained and disciplined and furnishing out its faith. It doesn't matter what you send me. Send me a Category 5 hurricane. It will not shake this church. Finally, number four. The church, according to Paul and Barnabas' ministry, must invest in leadership. And I don't pick, uh, we've been going through Acts, and this is perfect for today, because we're at the congregation meeting where we get to take part in the privilege of ordaining and setting apart leadership to serve our church. Amen? And we see that's an ancient, wonderful task. And in fact, the word here for elders is presbyters. That's where we get our name, Presbyterians. It just means elders. The church must invest in presbyters, leaders, local leadership, overseers of a local area, shepherds of a local flock is essential to the church. We need continual discipleship from those who have been committed to the Lord. First Corinthians reminds us that there are those who water, who are plant, and there are those who water. Of course, God gets the glory and makes it all happen. But it's built up, we build on a foundation. I, standing here, am building on a foundation that was established before me and before that. Yet it's important for us to have local leadership. Our, our elders, they build on this foundation. Therefore, it's, it's key for a church to invest in its leadership, its leadership's education, provision, and experience. These are critical matters. Calling, ordaining, Training and establishing church officers, be it elders or deacons, is central to the church's health and discipleship. Paul wrote and modeled this in all his churches. Titus 1.5, for example, he's always established local elders. And it's done, as we see here, which, with much prayer and fasting. And I'm so thankful for our nominating committee and the nominating committees previously who have taken that role to heart and have prayed, fasted, and sought who God is calling in our church because it's key to discipleship. We see the role of elder is to be respected and qualified. This list of spiritual qualifications. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Remember that. Your elders have to give an account to God for how they shepherded this church. That's a mighty thing. That keeps me up at night, <laughs> quite frankly. I have to give an account for my flock. Let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Titus 1 reminds us of these important qualifications that we think of today as for an overseer as God's steward must be above approach, not arrogant, not quick-tempered, not a drunkard or violent or greedy or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Disciplined. 
He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine. Instruction, right? These are, these are matters that take time. Teaching. Also able to rebuke those who contradict it. So all those things to, said, to say, beloved, may we follow after the apostles' investments. <laughs> may we receive their investments and build upon them. How are we investing in the future and in one another? Like I said, I'm not talking monetarily here. I'm talking spiritually, talking discipleship. How are we stewarding? We need to not only steward our finances, but we steward our spiritual gifts. We steward discipleship. Let us build a culture here that makes disciples who make disciples. And I end with that quote of reminder that we do not do it alone, but this journey that we're on is led by Christ. Beautiful song, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his faithful mercies? Who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, ere by faith in him to dwell, for I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being our guide. Lord, I pray that this word would take root, Lord, that we would take note of it, pull it into our heart, Lord Jesus, and that we would take these principles established by the apostles and invest them here in our church, and we'd live by them and breathe by them. Lord God, we pray that you would guide us in our meeting about to take place, Lord, that it would be pleasing to you and according to these principles. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.